Fan Buy sees hundreds, maybe over a thousand businesses a year as the CEO of the Hedgehog Company, an aggregator that has four brands in its portfolio right now, including Baboon to the Moon, probably the best known brand in the portfolio, and Fan as the CEO of an aggregator that has raised capital. A lot of his job comes down to buying and considering selling different ones of his portfolio of brands. And so Fan and I were hanging out a couple weeks ago. He's a brilliant e-commerce thinker and a, a guy who I just love talking to about the state of e-commerce in the world. And we, we were hanging out a couple weeks ago when he was in California and just got talking about sort of like what's going on in e-commerce land right now, what's going on in the MA market. Because he sees so many brands come across his desk, understands exactly where they're being valued in the market. How are you seeing what's happening? And I said, well, why don't you come on my podcast and let's do an episode about this. For all the founders out there who are thinking about selling their business at some point, they should know what they are trying to aim at. How do people right now in the world value their businesses? What should they be building for? How should they, should they care about revenue or profit or what? And Fan has clear and uh, experienced perspective on all of that. And so I have on the show today, Fan Buy, a great e-commerce thinker, as I said, a friend of mine, and somebody you're going to love hearing from on the Andrew Ferris podcast this week. So let's dive into my interview with Fan Buy. <laughs> Fan, thanks so much, man, for for coming. I when we hung out a couple of weeks ago, it was just a delight, and it was like just so fun. I know, you know, both of us, I think, got pretty quickly into uh, what are your observations about e-commerce right now? What's kind of floating at the top of your head? That sort of that sort of mode. So it's perfect podcast fodder. So thanks, thanks for joining me, man. How you doing? I'm good, Andrew. Uh, yeah, it was really great to see you in person. Although I thought it was this podcast was going to be a continuation of our last conversation which was a long two-hour meandering journey on the meaning of life. I didn't know that we we're going to be talking about e-commerce today. Yeah, yeah, we could do that, man. I mean, I did another interview actually just today with a founder of, about exactly that. So uh, it touched on a lot of conversations you and I hit. I Look, everything here is about the meaning of life in some way, right? Because what is really the point of going and getting an exit of your brand? Well, it better tie into what you sense the meaning of life is because you're spending a lot of time on it. I kid, but yeah, excited to talk all things e-commerce and, and I'm sure we'll get to the meaning of life another time. Yeah. All right. Maybe that'll be the follow-up piece. So, okay. You said something really fascinating that we should use as a jumping off point here to me, which is, again, I mean, let's actually play this game for a second. How many brands do you think you have looked at in M&A conversations, right? So let's just say Hedgehog Company is an aggregator. The best known company brand in your portfolio probably is Baboon to the Moon. Is that what you say? That's, that's right. right. That's fair. Yeah, great. And so you guys own four brands. So you and I got talking probably originally because we were both in aggregator land when I was at 4x400. We even, we even looked at selling you one of our brands at one point, all those kinds of things as we were leaving aggregator land, I should say. Um, and anyway, in, in that process for you as a CEO of that brand, m and is a big part of your job. And so you are thinking about what brands you might want to bring into your portfolio with the capital you guys have raised, all those kinds of things. So in light of that, how many brands, let's just play the game. How many brands do you think you've looked at in the last, let's just say year? Obviously, you're not going to get the number right on the head, but let's just ballpark it. Yeah, I think in the last like year or two, we've, I mean, we're probably close to a thousand. Yeah, that's a lot of businesses to look at. And yeah, how, of those thousand, how many do you think you're looking at their financials? Like, like are you actually getting to the point where you actually get their PL or, or something like that? That we've actually opened an Excel file on probably a third of those. Okay, great. That's a lot still. That's a lot. And and yeah. there's just such value, I think, in having that perspective. And so from that perspective, you told me when we were hanging out that you have a, a theory about e-commerce, which is that everybody right now, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people have been affected by a one particular brand's outcome. And, and maybe this brand is just emblematic of a total era. So tell me the theory. I think you know what I'm talking about. So I... I said something that I think might be controversial to others, although it's very clear in my head and kind of how we think about the world of the hedgehog, which is, but Obis and Andy Dunn and Pickwood did such an incredible job, inspired and set sail a thousand ships, probably a, you know, a million ships of founders that wanted to build e-commerce businesses. I think the potential trap is that it also set the idea that the default financial metric around valuation was a revenue multiple that they had raised, including from tier one investors at revenue multiples, and to their credit, exited at a revenue multiple. You know, for some, what three hundred and fifty million dollars plus or minus at around three times revenue on an unprofitable business. And so, 
throughout that journey, continue to get validated and ultimately got the validation that you could exit at a substantial revenue multiple. And so of the thousand e-commerce entrepreneurs that I've talked to in the last couple of years, so many of them are still coming in to a conversation with us being like, yeah, like I think my three, five, $15 million revenue business that's also unprofitable is worth three times revenue. And I think that's really dangerous. I mean, it's it's insane <laughs> at this point, right? Like, I haven't heard of a single, at this point, it, it reflects such a lack of awareness of the present state of the M&A market. And, you know, my reaction to that then is, is coming, is bubbling back up in my heart right now. I can feel myself reacting to it, which is like, people are still saying that because like, it seems so obvious to me that, you know, the valuation of your business is going to be basically a multiple of your EBITDA. You know, obviously there's there's some things that, are some extenuating circumstances in terms of what makes the multiple bigger and smaller, but that's going to be the foundation of the valuation for the vast majority of brands these days. That seems so clear to me. That's not obvious to lots of people, even still. You're, like the bonobos problem, or, you know, what I'm calling it, it's, not, it's not really their problem, but the bonobos problem that you're talking about is still a problem for people. I, I think absolutely. I, I think it's the I think it's the default. Now, I think more people are aware that the small market and low mid market trades on an EBITDA multiple. More people are aware of that fact that then. Maybe ever before, definitely, you know, both three years ago or five years ago. But I think that the default is still everyone operates on a revenue multiple for, I think, a couple of reasons. One, which is like, that's still how early stage equity funding, largely BC or family office or what have you, early stage equity funding happens. Because like, if Andrew and Fan started a like coffee cup company that was really innovative and whereas we had a million dollar run rate, but did have any EBITDA, like, and someone was going to, we wanted to raise money at a valuation, it wouldn't be valued on an EBITDA basis because we were six months into it. And, and so there, there's some implied revenue multiple. And so I think because of the way the funding ecosystem works and of the thousand brands, a lot of those would have raised money and they would say like, my last valuation that the investors gave me was a revenue multiple, probably was a two to three X revenue multiple. And I think the biggest difference is there's a huge gap between what a funding round valuation is with the implied structure of the investors having liquidation preference. We may get their money before founders get their money. And also just the mechanics of that, that's a set of securities that you're going to value it off that has different preferences, both like, hey, this is actually an exit. And what the investor is making a bet on is like, hey, I can own a quarter of this business. And if it's a runaway success, then great, but at minimum, I have one, maybe two, maybe three times preference that I'm going to get paid three times my money before anyone else gets paid. And, and those two things are very different, although most people view them as the same. That's super interesting. I didn't think about the impact that preference was having on the capital market on the front end of these things. Just for people who don't know, can you explain preference for investors in, in that so people understand what you're talking about there? Yeah, so... Sticking with the same example, Andrew and fans start a coffee company, coffee cup company, gets to a million dollar run rate. We say, hey, we think there's an opportunity here to build a $50 million revenue business. We go to our friend Taylor and say, hey, will you give us a million dollars for a third oh, of the terrible business? idea. I know Taylor too well. <laughs> Taylor, I'm assuming you're talking about Taylor Holiday. He is, he'll never invest in an e-commerce company. We got to go to somebody else. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in this parallel universe, Taylor gives us a million dollars and we say, okay, we're going to valuation will be $3 million. And he's like, well, you have no EBITDA. Okay. So if there's an implied revenue multiple, but I'm going to say, I want to, let's say even he wants to be aggressive. He's like, I don't, I, I like you guys. I don't know about the coffee cup idea, but I really like you guys. I'll put in a million dollars. So I want three times liquidation preference, meaning that I'll get three times my million dollars at minimum before Andrew or Fan get a dollar. So if we sell for $4 million, he gets a $3 million and then all three of us share in the remaining million dollars. But that just means the $3 million valuation isn't kind of a true valuation because he's got his preference. Makes perfect sense. Okay, so that's interesting. I mean, because that is the truth, right? That actually in any early stage investment cannot be an investment based on based on EBITDA to value the business. Like by definition, with the whole idea of raising an early stage, you're, you know, I mean, it's it's even a punchline to look at sort of like the charts that people show in those meetings to just talk about what their revenue and their EBITDA is going to be. It's just all made up. It's all an idea. And exactly what you said is actually why people are going to invest, right? I, 
I maybe like the, the coffee company idea. It sounds like we just started Simple Modern, by the way, which would have been a good business to start. But they really like us, you know, and so they're like, okay, I want to give you guys money. I have dry powder and I need to get into the into the market. And so and so they do that, but they're not going to do that based off of valuation. But see, when I, I think that the dots that I'm putting together in this conversation that I actually didn't even a couple weeks ago uh, are that founders are not realizing that that early stage valuation for raising money at that stage of things is fundamentally different than the kind of valuation that you're going to get at an actual exit. I think I didn't, again, I don't, maybe that seems obvious to me because I think it probably just because of my experience like at four by 400, they went through that. They raised a million bucks at a $10 million valuation early on. And the, the valuation was nonsense. Like it just was nonsense. Uh, you know, it was made up number about like where this might get. And then in the long, longer, even before I joined that, that's what the valuation was. But, you know, in my conversations with our investors, includes, which included very seasoned investors and a, you know, a PE guy and all those kinds of things, you know, they, they were crystal clear. Every meeting I ever had with them was about an EBITDA multiple and what we needed to get that number to and, and all those kinds of things. So, so maybe it's just because I had good investors who, who understood that really clearly and were, were drilling that into my head. But to me, that, that distinction seems obvious. You're, it sounds like you're saying many founders don't realize that it's going to work very differently on the back end of the, the sell transaction than it was on the raise transaction. Yeah, I, I think that, that I think those connecting results ex is exactly also how we read it, which is it's still much easier. Founders are dreamers, right? And it's much easier to dream in revenue multiples than it is in EBITDA multiples. Even though multiples are like a real person's work. So, okay, we raised a million dollars from Taylor at a $3 million valuation. Now we're like, okay, so we're with, like, it's easy to infer, okay, like we're worth $3 million, even though that's really the wrong lesson to take away from it. And then, because naturally it's like, well, we've got a million dollars, we should spend it. We're going to grow revenue run rate. And now we're, went from a million dollar run rate to a $4 million run rate. And, but because of the natural of a product based business, we're just gobbling cash gobbling ad spend, and we need to raise more money again. Again, no EBITDA multiple, so we go and raise another one. You go and raise $3 million, $5 million. And again, easy to infer that after a couple of rounds, the whole time, the whole world has been telling you that revenue multiple benchmark. But you stop growing, and things get a little bit harder, and you're like, shoot, okay, I, I can't raise the next round. Now what happens? Now you have to make the impossible traverse, near impossible traverse from a revenue multiple world to an EBITDA multiple world. And, th and that's the pain that everyone's been going through the last two years. Like I said, it's an almost impossible traverse because now you're looking at, for the first time ever, really seriously, everything below the narrow revenue line, which almost no one looks at, including investors. Like for most of the last 10 years, everyone is just like, I only care about net revenue growth. I don't care what's below the, the other 40 line items. And maybe I care a little bit about what the burn rate is at the bottom, but every, like, I think the really great founders in this space are incredibly meticulous about every point along those 40 lines between the top and the bottom line. And they're fighting for every single point. And because on each 50 basis points or 150 basis points on those 40 lines, they all start to add up. And then you either have a 15 percent EBITDA business or a negative 15% EBITDA business? Yeah, you know, I once had a conversation with a founder who I was pitching to work with. And I said, like, because I knew that this founder was attempting to sell at some point, And I said, hey, look, you had like, a, let's say it was a 1.5 ROAS in their ad account at some point. And I said, I think you can get that to 1.6 and you can pay me to do it. And that might look really, really small. But at your scale, that extra point, you know, was actually going to be worth I mean, I don't remember. Let's call it a million bucks or something like that. I don't even, I don't even remember what the actual number was. And that million dollars, the gap there actually was going, just by eliminating waste in their spend and some, some things with their media buying, right? And then just from there, I was saying like on that million dollars, let's say, let's even, let's just call it 500,000. So it's not as big of a number, right? But still, if they were going to have at some point an exit and they're going to be valued on their EBITDA, well, that money I just got back and that one little 0.1 point of ROAS is actually going to trickle straight to the bottom line because we're not doing, you, you know, well, I mean, you're going to pay me a little bit to get there. So not quite straight to the bottom line, but close. And when that's going to happen, that money is not actually worth $500,000 to you. What it's actually worth to you is, let's even make it smaller. Let's make it $100,000. If you're getting 8X on, on your exit, and this company was probably at a size where they could get at least that, right? What that's actually worth to you is $800,000. And so you, to your yeah. point about meticulous, I, this is why I talk all the time about like starting from the end here. Like, 
anybody who's listened to my show for a little while knows like this is why I care about bid caps. I actually don't care about bid caps at all. Like really, what I care about is profit because profit is actually what I care about is the valuation. That's what I care about. Enterprise value of your business. And the grounds for the valuation is your profit. And there are a bunch of little things you can do to get more profit. You know, two of the ones I talk about all the time is being smarter about wasting your ad spend and, you know, using tools effectively to manage your ad spend like bid caps or whatever. And then another one I talk about all the time is keeping a super lean OPEX. And I'm jumping the gun to another conversation here, but it's precisely for the reason that you just said, which is that good operators, and I've been around them too, they are meticulous about that. They care about it so much because ultimately, if the grounds of your valuation is that EBITDA number at the end or, or whatever, net income, however you want to say it, right, at the end, operating income. If that's the number, that's the case, then every dollar you save is getting multiplied in the valuation back to you. If you let's say you own 100% of the business, and even if you own 50% of the business or whatever, then you know you're going to get 50% of every 8x dollar you save or whatever it is. So it may, is a huge amount of money at the end of the day by doing those things really, really well, and by downgrading your Clavio account when you should, and so, you know all those kinds of things. You know they, they all really matter, and they get there. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to leave you a space there. I want to ask you another question in a second about EBITDA value based valuations, but but say what you're going to say. Yeah, I'll just like to reemphasize the point. I think again in the ecosystem, the, the half of the ecosystem that I play in, which is largely capitalized or VC backed or PE backed, just the, like the bootstrap, people are learning that they were playing checkers and are now playing chess. That for much in the last five to seven years, the game was just Facebook ad performance and net revenue growth. And now it's everything below the line. It is turning off the Clavio account. It is pushing for terms with your vendor. And if all of these things are in the 40 line items between top and bottom line, and that's just a very different muscle, which is why it's making it so hard to go from a revenue-based multiple mindset to an EBITDA-based multiple mindset. Yeah. So let's go there for a second, because I we're just implying a bunch of things that we actually haven't talked that much about yet, which is the actual basis for evaluation right now. When I relaunched my podcast as the End Affairs podcast and got away from hosting the e-commerce playbook podcast when I was with CTC and Forever 100 and those kinds of things, which is still a podcast you should go listen to because now it's hosted by the aforementioned Taylor Holiday and it's great. But when I did that, the very first episode I did was with Patrick Cadu from Supply. And Patrick had just sold his business. And so we talked through, he didn't give the exact number that he got, but we he talked through the basis of the valuation of his business. So if you are interested in this conversation, you should go back and listen to that because my sense of things right now, now this is about a year and a half ago when I, when I did that, my sense of things is that they're actually very similar in the marketplace. The, the valuation might be slightly lower now, but the baseline idea of how the business is valued is pretty similar now to what it was when I did that interview with Patrick. So go check that out. It's in the show notes. So let's let's talk about that. What is the actual... Like, what are the prices for brands right now? How are they being valued in the marketplace as you see it? Yeah, I think that uh, kind of from what we've seen, and we get a lot of, we have a lot of conversations with our friends at Quiet Light. I think that, you know, they're probably a thought leader here in terms of small market pricing. We sold at least one business with them at 4 over 100. They're great. Yeah. And yeah, you should just cut out this clip and they should be sponsor. So yeah, I think that like in the like sub million dollar EBITDA or SDE range, it's like probably two and a half to three and a half times plus inventory. And then like in the like one to three, then you're probably talking more four to five, maybe you get a six at a push. And, and that's really the space that we play. So like in the like, let's call it half a million, $2 million EBITDA range, which really implies you're probably a five to $15 million revenue business. And yeah, so you're really dealing with anything from two and a half to maybe six at the very high end if you're growing quickly. And then, yeah, the more of market you go, if you're kind of two and a half to $5 million in EBITDA or five to 10, then you kind of get a couple more turns, four to six, six to eight, eight to 10, et cetera. But again, in the small market, half a million to $2 million, it's going to be yeah, between three to, three to five is generally what we see. Now, the very important nuance is like, there's a difference between headline price and actually what you're seeing on day one and what's guaranteed. And I think what is happening today is it's just more structure. What is back-ended what is performance? You mean, yeah, right. You mean like there's an earn out that is really significant. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that's probably changed a lot this year versus last year where a year ago where it hadn't softened completely, you were maybe still getting three X, but you were getting 80% of the cash up front. Today, maybe you're only getting 50% of the cash up front and you know, 50% paid over over time, 
maybe with the Pullman scare. How I think that like between one to two years. Yeah. Okay. That's what I would have expected. That's super interesting. I mean, cause I actually, that was my first reaction to when you were citing those valuations is that like, they're pretty similar to what I heard, even when I was at four by 400, which, you know, I left at the end of 2021. Yeah, that's right. At the end of 2021 is when I left four by 400. And, you know, even then it was, I was looking like it's going to be based on EBITDA. And we were like, okay, if we get to 10 million and we were not close to that, but if we could get to, you know, 10 million, then, then you're talking about really getting up into numbers that get, you know, much bigger where the, where the multiples are maybe 10 X or, you know, plus you might be able to get 15 if it's cash flowing a lot, something like that. And those, you know, those details were all the things that, again, my really experienced PE board member was able to talk through and look at and say like, yeah, here's, here's where you start. Let's call it 10 X on 10 million or something. Well, okay. What happens from there? How do you get more than that? Okay. It depends on all kinds of things, right? De-risking the business. For example, if you have good channel diversity, if you've got sales traffic diversity versus let's say a business with 2 million in operating income, all of your revenue is coming from Facebook ads. You have relatively low LTV. Somebody might look at that and say, like, uh, you're still going to get solid money for that. You know, like you said, what What do you think? Two million, like 4X on that, maybe five. Yeah, right. Yeah. Something like that, right? But if you do those things, then maybe that four floats to a three and a half, et cetera. What I didn't know is that they were the, the, the structure of the deal was changing so much towards the sort of performance-based incentives and, and some of that stuff. That's, a, that's really different. You think that's just... Is that just because the market has softened and, and so so buyers are doing that because they can? Or is there like some sort of logic to it that's distinct? Yeah, I think it's more a reflection of the market. And it's also like, yeah, it's just a way for buyers to hedge. Like, okay, especially if a brand had some volatility in revenue, right? Like if you had a flat year versus last year, but you had a really strong year the year before, and they're like, shoot, over a two-year basis, you're like negative kagery. Does that mean the next two years might be down as well? Oh, I don't want to be buying a business that's like you know, 10% negative kagery over four years. So I want to hedge a little bit. So I think it's just a reflection a little bit on the market, what buys can get away with, performance of underlying brands that are selling. But I think the other, so like structure is definitely one nuance. The other big nuance is like what number in that chart of accounts in that P&L is the multiple based off. So in the, like, the top of the market in early 21, people were paying multiples of contribution margin, which is crazy. Measured net of ad spend? Net of ad spend. Okay, great. Right? And so they were saying, like, we can just absorb your GNA, right? We'll pay you 5x because we can just absorb your GNA. Let's just assume that your GNA is zero because we already have the infrastructure, the team, the whatever. And that's very, very different to crazy. You know, 5x on net income. Incredibly different. And then SDE is kind of this middle ground where it implies and you kind of take out the owner. And, but the owner still, everyone, like every quiet light list, well, any listing ever has always said the owner only works five, five hours a week. I've never seen a listing that says the owner does works more than five hours. I want to actually meet some of these mythical owners. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. So they always back out the, like the owner's like distributions, but in reality, like you still need someone actually running the business. And for e-commerce businesses today, more than ever, they're more complex and require a not inexpensive executive to run. So this SDE is this. So where are you taking the multiple off is kind of really important as well. Yeah, that's super interesting. I had one business valued on SDE when we sold it. It was FC Goods. And it was because... It was just because the EBITDA number was was small. And so, you know, there was like sort of sub 500,000. That kind of idea was like, that's going to get you an SDE multiple. Do you think that's still true? Just that SDE gets used if it's if it's a really small, a much smaller business? Yeah, I think it's a like great mechanism. The Which, by the way, you should just you should just explain SDE to people too, just so people know what, what that is. Yeah, so SDE stands for seller discretionary earnings. Basically allows to add back the owner's pay. So like, let's say uh, in a, an Android fans coffee cup business, we end up deciding to sell it at $3 million of revenue. It's doing... Three hundred thousand dollars in net income, but we're each paying ourselves two hundred thousand dollars, and so depending on the broker, you might either be able to add both of ours back, or at least add at minimum one of ours back. So now you're selling at a, either five hundred or seven hundred k. Multiple, you know, kind of put a multiple on that. Thus, the three hundred k. I think it's a great mechanism for brokers to kind of keep prices a little bit higher because remember, brokers get paid as a you know percentage of exit transaction. But as a buyer, you're like, 
well, shit, I don't know that I should be adding Andrew and Van salary back because they're, they're actually working pretty hard on the business. And if, they, if they're not getting paid, then I have to pay someone else. And so why do I want to be paying a multiple on 700K because I, you know, they're, they're still real costs. Yeah, I think the logic on the smaller business, that makes sense. The logic on the smaller business was that like essentially the kind of acquirer would be paying themselves that kind of money. They weren't buying it to buy it as part of a portfolio and then hire out the position. But the idea is like, just like, let's say I owned a business and sold it. Let's just call it, I don't know, uh, FC Goods. Like in that case, right? Like the, if I'm the CEO, I'm, it's not a big enough business for me to like go hire out a whole big team or whatever and really have much money left over. Like instead it's like, okay, you're going to work on it yourself and you're going to, and you're going to do that. And so then the valuation was based on the fact that you'd probably sell it to somebody to do the same thing. And so it has real monetary value to them as well. Cause they're going to salary themselves off the business basically. So, I mean, at least at the time, that was kind of the, the, the things that we we're looking at. Okay. So with all of this, what do e-commerce operators need to be thinking about now? What are they like, if, if you, you know, if, I mean, you, you have an aggregator obviously, but like if you're, building businesses now what are you doing to build them towards an exit and i don't mean this from an operator perspective i mean sort of like the way i always think about this is like PL design like what are you trying to what are you trying to accomplish and maybe another way of asking the same question is like what are the lies that are being told to operators that people are telling themselves or that are being told from external sources that are keeping them from thinking about this the way they should be i think first of all like you have to assume the base case, which is that your business exits on an EBITDA multiple. And I think the reality is that like most people aren't willing to think about it that way because there's no way that their business can exit on an EBITDA multiple. Meaning that we've looked at so many businesses where it does not work without continued external money. And often that is like true gross margin is like less than 30 points that the cap to LTV is, you know, upside down, Less than 30 points of margin landed? Yeah. And, and I think that, again, like during the hype cycle, there was just less scrutiny below the net revenue of, hey, like we're really good performance marketers. We're on a really trendy, like we're, we're on something really trendy, pick bill, keto, pick your like fad, you know, we're influ- influencer backed. It's just net, net revenue growth. And we'll worry about the like margin expansion stuff later. But yeah, I think there are a lot of businesses that just cannot work. Like it's too low gross margin. It doesn't convert. It's not a simple enough message. And that's a really tough spot to be in today. And I think that there are a lot of founders that are in that spot. And yeah, I think that that's, that's impossibly tough of where you're like, I've got something, it's maybe, you know, I'm doing a few million dollars in revenue, but there's no way I'm going to be able to eke out kind of any EBITDA in this business because it's low growth margin, it's complex enough that I still need enough heads to run it. And we're just kind of in this lame duck situation. I mean, that, that really sucks. Fan and I are talking in this episode about what makes a good e-commerce business. And look, what makes a good e-commerce business is profit at the end of the day. That's ultimately where this conversation is uh, centering on. And to build a great and highly profitable e-commerce business, you need to do a couple of things. The first is you need to operate the business effectively. And secondly, you need to do that while having enough money left over to generate profit and therefore a high value of your business. And that means operating effectively while staying relatively lean. It is one of my core beliefs about e-commerce that you can run a very lean operate op x in your business and have a great business one of the ways to do that is to add incredible talent to your team from the philippines people with deep experience in e-commerce pay them a very competitive salary for the philippines but a lower salary than you would pay the same person with equal experience in the u.s is a win-win and you can find that talent in the philippines by going to my friends at more staffing and i want to specifically tell you about their service more fractional 
fractional supply chain. Uh, Fan and I, in this episode, are talking a whole bunch about all of the different efficiencies you can get in your business by doing a great job on your supply chain. Things like negotiating terms with your manufacturers, managing inventory well, buying not too much or too little inventory, all of the things that go into a great cash consideration cycle in your business, the ability to test new products, do all those things. More fractional supply chain can help. They have deep experience in e-commerce supply chains. That's actually the genesis of their business, and they can help you do that. If you are considering adding supply chain talent to your business, go do it with More Fractional Supply Chain as part of More Staffing. You can go to morenow.co and use the code AJF20 to get 20% off your first three months. That's AJF20 to get 20% off your first three months at morenow.co. Talk to them about their whole business. Talk to them specifically about More Fractional Supply Chain to get fractional supply chain support from your business from real experts in the Philippines right now. Is the lie that they're telling themselves in that case just that they have a good business? You know what I mean? Like, I think that that, that is the lie that they're telling themselves. I think it's a lie that like I'm super empathetic to that. And yeah, I was a you know I started as a D2C founder that was like in kind of a lame duck situation. Operated the business for several years, didn't get to scale, even on neutral. Yeah, like there's a ton of loss aversion. Uh, like I've spent all this time when you just make something of it, but it's yeah, really tough. Yeah, I mean, in that case, it sounds like the, the move is for the business to just be done. And I understand that too. There's businesses that are just dead on arrival and you don't realize that. I mean, it's certainly one of the things that's happened for me over time, and this is partly the result of a lot of mistakes, is just realizing what a good and bad e-commerce business actually even is at this point. And you know, less than 40 points of gross margin is, mo- is usually a bad e-commerce business. There's a couple of exceptions to where that can work, but it's really specific. And yeah, that would just be one of those things I would look at and say, don't even start. I mean, there's just, if that was the product that was given to me, I just wouldn't even, it wouldn't even be a starting point conversation for me. You know, there's just no, no world in which you do it. I mean, do you have a sense right now when you think about, is there a, is there a profile of a business that you think this is what makes a good e-commerce business besides just, you know, has bottom line income? Yeah. I mean, I think like, you know, if I think, if I start from the top revenue quality is definitely like, there's a reason that software businesses historically have been valued at a revenue multiple at 10 X revenue multiple plus or minus. And that's all due to the revenue quality. Like that, that revenue of a software business, the really, really great ones is like an, an investment grade bond, right? Like it is, it is going to pay consumer discretionary e-commerce. That is not an investment grade bond. And so revenue quality really matters. Subscription can help. But even subscription, like, I mean, we see so many subscription businesses that have really high churn. Revenue quality is really important. Growth margin, but then like including transit, like actually like net of returns, net of credit card processing. You really want something that's north of 45, ideally 50 points, which is really hard because it means that your landed FOB probably needs to be close to 70 points. And which you get is just quite hard. Yeah. 70 landed is is pretty tough. It's hard. I mean, and yeah, you're saying net of returns, net of credit card processing fees. So that's essentially 3% for processing no, so, fees. Most, what's that? So sorry, just to clarify. So 70, 70 points of product margin and 50 points of true gross margin, right? Yeah. Including like yeah. transport returns, credit card yeah. processing. Yeah. yeah, I always think of that as, uh, I like the way that like people have said this for, for P&Ls and e-commerce as cost of delivery as the thing that is like, the total bucket. And what that includes is the product, of course, including freight to your warehouse, which is part of your product costs, and the packaging, all those things that make up your product costs. But then from there, it's also like freight to the customer. And then it's credit card processing fees, things that are variable costs associated with every single order that a customer places. And then returns, while that's sort of not true cost of delivery in the same way, it is a bankable number for most businesses. You can just sort of say, yeah, it's three percent, or it's five percent, or if you're in apparel business, it might be twenty percent. Like it's like yeah. it can be really, really big. And yeah, so those margin considerations are just really tough. And you know, I mean, it's interesting that you say fifty is hard to get to. I, I would look at it and say, like, in a D to C business for a really good business, I want that number net of all those things to be over sixty five. If I can get there, you're you. It sounds like you see very few of those. And almost impossible to get to that. You know, and what we see, I think, like you see it some. In like beauty and supplements, which is why those categories are so hot, because you have like 90% landed product margins, and then that's how you can get the 60% net of cost of delivery. Because there's also those businesses that are like, 
don't really have a returns problem. Like, you know, you're not, you're not really going to return the like $8 supplement thing, but then delivery can also eat into like a, you know, low AOV product. And so, yeah, if we, if we can get north of 50% less cost of delivery, we're, we're pretty happy. But I think the, what's more common is people have targeted a 50% landed and then end up with a 25 or 30% less, you know, cost of delivery. And that makes it really, really tough. Yeah. I mean, you, you just can't compete at any, with any scale with any advertising dollars unless you have monster LTV and most brands in that category. I mean, all the monster LTV brands are like supplement brands and stuff. You know, it's really, it's really rare that you have like truly, truly, really high LTV. Yeah. Otherwise, if you have to live your life at a three to one on Facebook or a four to one on Facebook to make money, then you're in trouble. It's going to be really hard to do that on any real, real scale. Uh, I think the second kind of beyond gross margin, beyond revenue quality, we're looking at cash conversion and kind of working capital and then relationships with vendors. Like, is there any float available? Because otherwise, like, again, you're just always in this really tight cash buy, especially in the early years. You're not enough scale to actually have any real retained cash. It's always going into next seasons. And Mentorians, so I think that becomes really, really challenging, which is like, why e-commerce is also really tough where you can have brands that have been even are profitable for years and then have one bad have year. No cash. Uh-huh. Yeah, and oh, have right. never yeah. had cash. I've never had cash yeah. for six years. Even are profitable, paying taxes for six years. And then bam, one bad year. And they're like, shit. Like I never retained cash in building a healthy business in six to seven years. And I just had like I overbought this year and just got totally squeezed. And that just really sucks. Yeah, that's super interesting. That's very tough. So High gross margin, even you'll take over 50%. That still surprises me. And let's say cost of delivery out of that, right? High cost yeah. delivery percentage, low cost delivery, high high percentage margin there. Well, just good cash conversion is that's number two, pillar number two. Anything else that you see as like really core to being what makes it a good business? Yeah, so if we just, yeah, 50 points. And then four, if you can have produced revenue quality with 25%, add spend to net revenue and run a somewhat, so then you got 25 points of contribution margin, right? And then like, this is where the complexity of the business really matters. So we see, you know, we're talking about lies of e-commerce today, like another lie is like multi-channel. Again, pretty controversial thing to say, because it's like the it word of consumer brands in 2023 and probably 2022 as well. And it probably will be for 2024. What we see is a lot of subscale brands, sub 5 million, sub 10 million even, that are in four channels. They're in, they're on .com, they're on Amazon, they're in other marketplaces, they're in retail, they're in international. And that is a freaking complex business. And you know what complexity means? Heads. Yeah, that's right. It's impossible to say lean. Yeah, and it just drives so much DNA. And all of those channels need support. Like not even just in headcount, and also in ad dollars. Yeah, that's super interesting. I mean, it's funny because you and I have not talked much about this, but we are... Meaning of life, Andrew. You and I, we're just... You and I, just meaning of life. It's all meaning of life. No, I mean, but that that point to me, like this is something I've been coming back to a lot recently, is that people really need to internalize the idea that both, first of all, focus has compounding value. There's probably a lot more you can get out of your D2C than you think. I mean, you can build a pretty big business D2C with a bunch of profit. And if you can just focus there, you can make your sales funnel better. You can make your email capture better. You can send better and more emails. You can make your ads better. You can generate a better creative team. You can probably get some Google ads going. You know, there's like a lot of different things that you can do to create a pretty good D2C business. And the beauty of them is to do that very well with that one channel, you can actually do all of that quite lean. Um, and it scales beautifully. The example I always give is it takes the same amount of money to design one email, whether you send that email to a thousand people to, or to a million people. And so therefore your GNA against that email design is quite a bit, you know, is, is massively lower as a percentage as your business scales. And so because the business can scale so well D to C without having a big team, low OPEX as a percentage of revenue, where OPEX is really defined, I just mean SGNA basically. If low SGNA as a percentage of revenue, fixed costs, low fixed costs as a percentage of revenue, 
is one of the fundamental advantages of D2C as a business model. And the moment you go omni-channel, you risk forfeiting that advantage of the model. If there's enough scale there in your omni-channel outreach or, or expansion, it can be totally worth it. Don't get me wrong. There are plenty of businesses where it's completely the right decision to do. But a lot of people also just don't think enough about the fact that focusing in that one area both keeps you lean and actually creates a whole bunch more compounding value over the long term. And then when you go layer on, another channel, once you're at 20, 30, 40 million dollars in D2C revenue or whatever, that channel is actually more set up to succeed because because you've now probably invested a whole bunch of money in ads to get there and, you know, reached customers in a way that is, is going to make more sense. And now you're going to have more visibility or more awareness when you get on the shelf and all those kinds of things. And so, so to me, that's that's one of the huge things. It is it is part of why my sponsor for my show is a staffing agency in the Philippines. It's they are great people, but it's another way to take that same model and say, like, Wait a minute. This is another advantage from all these work from home business work from home businesses, which is that you can not only find great people, but you can also find them in places where you don't have to pay them as much as you know. For most of these businesses that are U.S. based, a U.S. salary, and now you can make that GNA even smaller while getting incredibly talented people. That's a huge win if you're trying to build your business for EBITDA, and it's you know I. So yeah, so it, to me, it's it's a huge thing. The example I always think of here is ButcherBox because I heard an interview with their CEO where it was like. It was like 160 employees at 500 million plus in revenue. It was a few million dollars ahead, basically. That I mean, I mean, the host of the show was interviewing him, who was not always dealing in D2C businesses, couldn't believe it. He was like, what in the world? You're doing that much revenue per head in your company? And it's because they're basically pure play D2C still at that kind of scale. I mean, they might be literally that. I don't know if they do any other distribution channels. I have no idea. But but you're able to build a very big business. There's plenty of people on the internet to buy your products. There's plenty of them. You don't need to do channel expansion to necessarily to capture all that demand. It can, it can, can be helpful, but uh, you don't necessarily have to do it either. And in a world where you where you stay D to C, man, you can do a lot of revenue per head and that trickles straight to the bottom line of that PL and straight to the valuation of your business like you're talking about. So like, this is a hobby horse for me right now because I think it's so important for people to, to really get this right is to understand that the combination of that with pretty good landed margin is very, very, very powerful for building a, a really valuable business. Yeah, and I, like I said, I, for it's a... Um... There's more focus on all the items kind of below net revenue now, and and I think that's you know productive for the industry. Yeah. Anything else that's on that list? Again, I'm thinking of that that uh, listener who's building an e-commerce business, which is definitely a lot of my listeners, or serving people building an e-commerce business, which is another bunch of my listeners. Thinking about structuring their business for success at, at sale. You're just one person, but you have this a very good view into the system. So margin, cash conversion cycle, lean GNA. Anything else that you'd put onto that list that you think of as really important in building a really good business? Yeah, if, in terms of like if I was starting a new e-commerce business today, like I'd almost certainly start. I, I'd want to look for, I'd give up cap table space, like ownership space to try to buy some unfair advantage. Now, a very played one is kind of influencer, whether that's direct or through an agency, but like, if you can get into some kind of audience, that's not even just kind of like Hollywood influencer. That could be like buying into a community, someone that has an online audience, someone that has a blog. Hey, like we'd love to partner with you. You can, I'll give you 30%, 10%, 30%, whatever. And yeah, you can reduce your paid spend from 25% to 15% because you're getting 50,000 monthly uniques from a free source. Amazing. Another unfair advantage might be on the manufacturing side. Sell the dream, we'll give you cap table space. If you give us terms, discount, priority, product development budget, et cetera. And short, yeah, priority for shorter time delivery, basically, right? Cut down, cut down the time between ordering and receiving your product. That's a huge deal in DC. It just allows you to be so much more flexible on your inventory buying. Yeah, I'd look for an unfair advantage on, and, and maybe both. And then the third one is just like, I think the bar is today much, much higher on actual product differentiation. I think great point. five years ago, much easier to put a skin on something from Asia and then be really good at performance marketing and positioning. And today to have anything that endures beyond like a 12 or 18 month fad needs to, because anything that hits, it's going to have 10 copycats the next year. So having something that has something that in, is differentiated, which is why something like solo stove is still going so strong 10 years in. I don't know. I, like, 
Andrew and Van aren't starting solo stove tomorrow. We're starting a coffee cup, cup company, but we're not starting solo stove tomorrow. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that barrier to entry point is totally right. I mean, I've just I've thought about this all the time. Like, what should I try and go back and run a brand or something like that? And you, you have repeatedly told me not to, by the way. But one of the things I think about is like, I just don't know if I could, I'm just not a product guy and it makes me not want to do it because it's just like, you need something probably better than what you would have needed a number of years ago to go make this happen. And, you know, the sort of dropshipper mentality is, is probably, those days are probably behind us mostly on top of the fact that I want to sleep well at night and not just sell people crap so I can make money. Okay. Anything people should be doing to prepare themselves for an exit? Uh, let's say you are getting towards that point. You got a couple million bucks in EBITDA. You're thinking about selling any last, any last kind of pieces of advice for people who are moving towards that phase besides selling the business to you? Yeah, I think that um, they should definitely talk to a broker or a banker, depending on the size they are. And just to get a get a third party view of their space, I think like a lot of folks are looking for EBITDA consistency. And so like if you can have four, six, eight quarters of where it's, you know, people get a little bit scared where like if it's a highly seasonal business or like your performance is just really volatile, hey, like profitable one quarter, unprofitable the next, profitable the one quarter, unprofitable the next. I think that's tricky. So just kind of preparing for that. But yeah, if you're in an even a healthy business, you're in a good spot. Like, I think it's a tough time to be selling. So if you can wait it out, even some of our good banker friends are like, they're, they're telling their clients like, hey, just wait to 24, see how things shake out. Like, this is not a good time to go to market. Super interesting. Yeah, just just maybe just just see if you can get a better valuation by waiting for longer. And yeah. keep keep playing whack-a-mole with that p and in that, in that in that world, right? Just go figure out how to change your... Delivery time from six weeks to five with your with your uh, manufacturer. Figure out how to get you know terms. I mean, even if you go from you know thirty down, seventy on receipt to thirty down, thirty on receipt, forty. Uh, you know, like whatever. Every little bit helps. You know, forty to thirty. You know, like there's like all kinds of little things you could do to just try to push those things out, make your business a little bit better. Think about getting a little bit leaner, being a little bit smarter. Yeah, makes sense. All right, people should follow you on Twitter. You're a great follow on Twitter. You want it, you, your beat on Twitter is is the analysis of brands, earnings, and sales. And so, if you are sort of interested in this conversation and want to see how markets are being valued, Fan is a is like an absolute ideal follow. I think it's what at Life of Buy. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. I just remembered that. But of course, the link will be in the show notes there, so you can go follow Fan on Twitter. And if you are interested in selling Fan your business, you can go to thehedgehogcompany.com and go check out what they're doing over there and reach out to him. Should people just DM you on Twitter? Is that, is that or should they email you? What's the best way to do it? Totally. Fan at thehedgehogcompany.com, Twitter. Yeah. Easy to find me. All right, man. Well, we'll have to do Meaning of Life next time. Any final words for anybody here or, or do we about cover it? Yeah. It's, if you've got a good business, I think like kudos, it's a, it's a tough market. Like e-commerce operator friends, we should try not to beat ourselves up. It is a tough environment. So I think the default is it's hard. So I try to tell everyone that I talk to that like, don't like you know, be too sad if you're having a you know soft year. But yeah, like we, you know, we try to improve our business every day and, and that's all we can do. I think that's really good advice. All right, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. There's my conversation with Fan. I loved this conversation. I actually love talking to Fan anytime I get a chance to. I could probably hear that in the conversation. I just love thinking through what makes a good e-commerce business and what doesn't. If you liked this episode, do go back and listen to my interview with Patrick Cadu from a year and a half ago. You might also like my episode with Dan McCormick from a few weeks back, who is the founder of Create Wellness, a creatine gummy brand. Because Dan and I talked a whole bunch about how he has structured his business in the earlier stages, and he shared this very publicly, for the kind of success that Fan and I talked about today, building a business for both scale and profit in D2C. Uh, Dan's got real clarity about that. And so if you want to hear sort of some more outworking of this from an operator who really understands this point really well, go listen to that episode. It is also linked in the show notes. Don't forget, of course, to go reach out to my friends at More Staffing and More Fractional Supply Chain to get help for your e-commerce business from the Philippines. As they say, virtual assistants are helpful. Virtual professionals can be transformative. Go to morenow.co. Use the code AJF20 to get 20% off if you use more fractional supply chain to add supply chain talent to your business. Uh, You know where to find me, but just in case you need a reminder, email me at podcast at AJFgrowth.com. Find everything I'm doing at AJFgrowth.com. In fact, you can go see, get on my wait list if you want to work with me, all those kinds of things. And of course, follow me on Twitter at Andrew J. Ferris. 
where you should also go follow Fan, as I said at the end of the episode. He is really a great follow and you will like it. As always, I would love it if you would rate and review and subscribe. Hope you are having a great Christmas break. If you are somewhere where that is part of what you're getting right now, maybe a little slowdown between the holidays and January, hopefully in your business, if you're not in the wellness space. And that's certainly what I'm getting in, in my getting a little bit of a uh, slowdown here uh, at this time, at the time this podcast is going to be released. Thanks so much for listening to me again this year. It's been a year of growth and a year of really appreciated. A bunch of really good feedback on the show. I would always love to hear from you. If this show has been helpful to you or if you think it could be better, please do reach out to me. Otherwise, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all those things. I'll see you next time. Thanks.